specifically uh, chapter 16 in 1 Samuel. And we'll read from verse 1. And if you have your Bibles, youth, do you have your Bibles? Amen. I see maybe everyone pulling out their electronics. God bless you for having something to be able to read the word of God. Amen. Let's read. And the Lord said unto Samuel, How long wilt thou mourn for Samuel, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill thine horn with oil, and go, and I will send thee to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided me a king among his sons. Amen. Everybody say, provided me a king. The, the Lord has already provided himself a king to rule over. A little bit of context before we go through in the scripture. There is a lot of reading, but bear with me. Um, king Saul was anointed king over Israel. There was no king at the time uh, as the Israelites had judges to rule over the land. Uh, they would sin. God would send a judge to rise up and deliver them out of bondage and captivity. And then uh, after the last set of judges, um, we have the prophet Samuel stepping on the scene. And uh, this is where they start pleading for a king. They wanted to be like all the other nations around around them. Give us a king that way we, we may rule like them and we can serve our king and we can be just like them. And I feel it in the Holy Ghost that this world, that the, the way that it's going, you youth have to guard your eyes instead of and not say, that's the way that I want to live my life. Amen. I felt that check as I was praying this week for this word. But let's continue to read verse 2. And Samuel said, how can I go? Is Saul hear it? Then he will kill me. And the Lord said, take an heifer with thee and say, I'm come to sacrifice to the Lord. We're going to jump down to verse 6 for the sake of time. And it came to pass when they were come that he looked on Eliab and said, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. So he's in the house of Jesse, and Jesse, the father of David, and his six other brothers, has three older sons, the oldest sons, and he has so much confidence in his three eldest sons. His first one is Eliab, and he said, and Samuel says, surely the, the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord, in verse 7, said unto Samuel, look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth uh, not as man seeth, for man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart, young people. Young people, you might be overlooked sometimes. Seven siblings in one household is a lot. I grew up with four, not too much. I am the eldest, actually. But how many have seven siblings, or a big family at least? Wow, there's some youth in here in the back. And it's sometimes, if you're not the oldest, especially the youngest, any youngest out of the bunches? Right here, right here, to get overlooked. But it's not the age that gets the inheritance in this generation. It's not how man usually sees it. Okay, that's the most athletic one. He's the most presentable He's the most handsome. She's the prettiest. They're going to inherit all of, the, all, all of the inheritance of this family. It's not like that in this case because God, the Bible says that he is looking at the inward appearance of the man, not as, as man sees it. Let's continue to read. Then Jesse's called Abinadab. Here's my second son, Samuel. Made him pass before Samuel, and he said, Neither hath the Lord chosen this. Then Jesse made Shema to pass, and he said, Neither hath the Lord chosen this. Again, Jesse made seven of his sons to pass before Samuel, and Samuel said unto Jesse, The Lord hath not chosen any one of these that I have seen so far. Verse 11, And Samuel said unto Jesse, Are here all thy children? And he said, There remaineth yet the youngest, and behold, he keepeth the sheep. Everybody say, keep it the sheep. And Samuel said unto Jesse, send and fetch him, for we will not sit down till he come hither. We're not going to go any further until I see every single one of your kids and the youngest. If he's out there doing a lowly job, one that was passed down, oh, do the dishes. Oh, oh make your bed. Oh, take out the trash. But why, Mom? But why, Dad? Oh, keep it the sheep. It's a dirty job. It's not glorious, and his, as, you, as we, we'll read, his three eldest, are, they join the army right away, and they follow King Saul, and this is, this is a good position. This is like what people go for in, in life. And this time, being a soldier in the army is the typical job. This is what we, they strive to be, they aspire to be. Here, now in our current day, 
it's to be a doctor, a policeman, firefighter, all of that. But in this time, to be a soldier is doing well, is making a name for your family, amen? But here, a young shepherd boy just tending to the sheep, and we're going to see why this matters. Um, we're going to jump down to verse 12. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was a ruddy and withal a beautiful countenance and a goodly to look to. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren, in the midst of everybody that doubted him. Maybe even his dad said, Really? But look at this. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. Amen. Before we move any further, can we pray one more, one more time? Lord, I thank you, Jesus, for this day. Father, on a Saturday, I could have been somewhere else, but God, you have opened up ways and doors for me to be here. You have allowed my parents to get me into this house, onto this pew, to hear a word from you. Father, let me not discount Jesus in a moment. You can quicken it with the Holy Ghost. We know that your spirit already dwells in here, and I thank you, Jesus, for your words that would follow. In Jesus' name, everybody say amen. So uh, we're going to read verse 14, and then we're going to jump a whole chapter. Remember, I gave you a little bit of context. King Saul is the first king of Israel after uh, the prophet Samuel. But... In his disobedience in, uh, in chapter 14, and uh, you can read this. I challenge you to go in there and read it for yourself. This is something that uh, God can give you understanding and wisdom about uh, beforehand. But for the sake of time, we're not going to go through the, the whole story of Saul. But verse 14 in chapter 16 says, But the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. And as you can see, there's like a, a transaction here. Uh, David is anointed with oil by Samuel, uh, and the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, is upon him as after that happens. And then we see in verse 14 that it's pretty much just the opposite with Saul. Let's jump to chapter 17 now. This is the battle in, El- in the Valley of Elah. Uh, this is probably the most, one of the most popular battles that you can read throughout the whole Old Testament. And... Uh, I haven't been around so much to hear so many uh, of these preachings. So everything that I'm going to talk about today, uh, it just came to me this week in prayer, bits and pieces, and I would take little notes here and there. Amen. And I hope that God would deposit everything that he's given me into you young people or even you old people. Verse seven, uh, chapter 17, verse 1. Now the Philistines gathered together their armies to battle and were gathered together at Shoko which belongeth to Judah, and pitched between Shoko and Ezekah, and Ephes Damim. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together and pitched by the valley of Elah and set the battle in array against the Philistines. Uh, and the Philistines stood on the mountain on one side, and Israel stood on the mountain on the other side, and there was a valley between them. So you have this big grand scene. Uh, if you ever look it up online, it's a beautiful valley. You have the Philistines on one encamp, and then you have the children of Israel on, on one with King Saul over them. Uh, verse 4. And there went out a champion. Everybody say champion. Champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a, and a span. So that's a little bit over nine feet. He's almost as tall as a basketball hoop. And he had a helmet of brass upon his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of brass. This is about 125 pounds of armor just on this champion. A champion is a person that fights solely by themselves, you call one person out, and whoever is the winner over that single battle, one-on-one, I'm pretty sure. Who, who gets in fights around here? Don't raise your hand. Don't, don't point yourself out. But it's, a, it's, a, it's an act of just sparing the whole war. And, but they actually fought. It says that they, the Philistines, the Israelites and the Philistines put the battle in array. But here, a champion says, enough of this. I'm going to puff my chest out. I'm going to make my, my presence known in the earth right now, and I'm, I'm here. I am a giant, and I'm here in your situation. 2022, I am here, and I am here in the education system to puff my chest out and declare some things. 
This is a giant. We face many giants. His brother Godfrey was uh, hinting, alluding to some of these things in the earth that's happening. There's no time and as or an hour like this. The prophets, the they would search diligently in the scriptures. The angels look for this hour, the, the, the hour before the Lord cometh, and he takes his church. But before then, there is tribulation here right before us. And I, and I, I urge you, youth, to listen to these next few words because I felt so, so strongly to warn and to caution every one of you that no matter what the education system says, no matter what your friends out in the world might draw your attention to, no matter what social media or no matter what commercials or movies or even the music that you listen to, that you might entertain weekly, that you might hear out loud accidentally from your friends, no matter the agenda that they promote, it doesn't matter how much the chest of that Philistine giant puffs up and says, this is the way, this is the way. You've got to know the Lord that is inside of you. Amen. Let's continue to read. And he had greaves of brass upon his legs and a target of brass between his shoulders. And the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam. And his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron and bearing a shield went before him. His own staff was about over 30 pounds. And he stood and cried unto the armies of Israel and said unto them, Why are you come out to set your battle in array? Why are you even trying, youth? Why are you even here? Why are you worshiping? Why are you singing, lifting up that name? What's so special about it? Has he really done a work in your life? Are you still struggling with something in your mind even right now? I'm not here to push con condemnation. Hear me. But I'm telling you that the Holy Ghost is going to work something special in every single youth, in every single old person. Verse 9, if he be able to fight with me and to kill me, then will we be your servants? But if I prevail against him and kill him, if I take ownership over your soul, you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. That's overconfident. When Saul and all Israel heard those words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. This scares me because this is the king over Israel. He was anointed over Israel. He tore two oxen when you read previous chapters in half, and he sent them all throughout Israel. He would prophesy. He was done. He was used in such a mighty way. He worshiped greatly. He sung greatly. He preached with anointing before. He served under his pastor greatly. He was such a good sister or a sister, a sister or brother to a person to be able to minister wise words in those times. But then all of a sudden there's this switch. We read it earlier that the spirit of God departed from Saul. And now all of a sudden David is anointed with oil and now the spirit of God is with him. This is a caution to not get so overconfident to rely on flesh and on yourself and on your own strengths, your own skills and your own talents. The whole story between David and Saul is the man of the flesh, which is Saul, and the man that walks in the spirit and that leans on the spirit of God. I can't do this. And in my weaknesses, your strength is made perfect. I wish David could hear. He hears it right now in heaven, but I'm telling you, if he had the New Testament, he would know these things. He reacted in these things. I believe he understood these things by being a humble servant and tending to the sheep. You read in Exodus in chapter 3 when before Moses goes back to the Israelites and takes them on this van uh, this grand voyage out of the hand out of from under the hand of uh, Pharaoh he's in the desert place in Midian and he's tending to his fa his father-in-law Jethro's sheep. And he goes on to the other side of the Mount of God, which is Horeb. And he sees the burning bush and the flame of fire. And it's not consumed. And the angel of the Lord gives him what he, ne what he needs, the power to go back into Israel and to deliver them. But what was he doing before all of this? He was just tending to his father's sheep. He was on the run. He just murdered a man. And he, now he's in the desert place for 40 years. 40 years. Look at the significance in that. Goliath is taunting the earth for 40 days. Here we have Moses on the run for 40 years, but he's still humble enough to just tend to some lowly sheep. 
But I was once a prince that ruled in the courts of Pharaoh. I was fed grapes. I had a, I had a barber. I had a, what do they call it? A tailor. He had a butler. He had a baker. He had all of these things at his disposal, but yet he's here now tending the sheep. We're not here to talk about Moses. We're, the highlight of this is David. A young shepherd boy, but the simple fact in attending to the little details, don't discount when your youth leader is saying, let's join together on a Friday night or on a Saturday morning, Saturday afternoon for these things. Let's get together and let's just fellowship. There's power in it. There's anointing. There's a reason. There's a spiritual bond that you cannot see. Don't discount the, the simple things of going through a little bit of scripture, your daily devotion. That scripture can come to you in an instant in your little trial. And it can give you the strength to overcome a voice that says, man, why do you even try? Why do you keep going? Uh, but if you were to know the scripture, it would give you life. Amen. Let's keep reading. I'm going to actually skip for the uh, sake of time. Uh, during this whole time, um, Goliath is still boasting now, uh, Saul and Israel heard the words of this Philistine, and they were, what, what did we, we read, dismayed and greatly afraid. Your first reaction in a time of uh, need, a time of scarcity, and being dismayed or scared to your boots is prayer. They should have sought counsel immediately. I would have went to Samuel and like, hey, Samuel, I need some, I need some advice. Hey, Saul, what are you doing? Just staying under your tent. Lead us. Lead us. Pray if someone would have just reached out. And here we go. Just a young, simple boy, David, the son of the Ephrathite of Bethlehem, Judah. I'm reading in verse 12. Whose name was Jesse. He had eight sons, and the man went among them for an old man in the days of Saul. And the three eldest sons of Jesse went and followed Saul to battle. Here the three eldest are there on the front lines. And uh, we read their names. I'm going to jump down to verse 14. And David was the youngest, and the three eldest followed Saul. But David went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep. This is verse 15, at Bethlehem. And the Philistine drew morning and evening and presented himself 40 days. And I'm going to jump up to verse 23 now. Sorry. Thank you, Brother David, for jumping through these. I can't even see it. And as he talked with them, behold, there came up the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, out of the armies of the Philistines, and spake according to the same words. And David heard them. That's the difference. Somebody heard it. Somebody filled with the Spirit of God heard the boast of the, of the enemy, of the giant, of the champion. Do you see the difference? There's something that's going on in your school, maybe, that all your classmates are like, man, that's tough. So that's tough to digest. I, okay, that's just the way life is going to be. You see, the Philistines stood still. They're armed and dangerous. They have swords. They have helmets. They have armor. They have spears. If you do, the re, if you do a little bit of research about the, um, about the Benjamites, they were left-handed. They were tough. They, in, the, in the book of Judges, they could sling a sling, and like they could kill within a hair's breath. They were that accurate. The, being left-handed is just, it's, a, it's, a, it's an advantage in battle. It's an advantage in sports. I, I love tennis. Left-handers are my arch nemesis. I don't like going against them. I can only imagine when your life is on the line, a left sword or a left throw. Come on. If you see, if, how many know the story of David already? Right, raise your hand. Okay, so we know that David does sling the sling. But you see, if you rewind and you pause for a second in, 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 this, in this moment right now where we're at, Saul is a Benjamin. He's from the tribe of Benjamin. There was only a small fraction that was saved at this time when you read through the last set of judges. The Benjamites were almost completely annihilated. And the Israelites said, let's not wipe off a whole tribe off of Israel, off the 12 tribes. So they can serve a few hundred men. And Saul's great, great, great ancestor, grandfather, maybe four or five generations prior, was one of the ones that survived. But everything was passed down. The whole, the, the weaponry, the arsenal, these are people that were trained in battle. Saul could have easily stepped on that battlefield 
and puffed his chest right back at the giant and used his advantage, used his weaponry, but he didn't. We have a, a young shepherd boy from Judah who learned all of these valuable tools shepherding sheep. He used what was at his disposal, youth. He took advantage and he knew the anointing that was in his possession He had the word of God. He had this little prayer closet. He had this relationship with God. And he knew how to resort on him. And we're going to read that. Verse 24. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were sore afraid again. And the men of Israel said, Have ye seen this man? This has come up. Surely to defy Israel as he come up, it shall be that the man who killeth him, the king, will enrich him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. And David spake to the men that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that killeth the Philistine and taketh away the reproach of Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that should defy the armies of the living God? And so they go through this dialogue. Hey, you're going to get this. You'll be enriched by the king. You won't even pay taxes, you and your whole family. So Saul hears of this, and he knows prior to chapter that he's his armor bearer. Somebody, word gets out, uh, he has three other brothers, so there's some sort of connection. Saul calls him to his tent, we, and this is where we pick up in verse 31. And when the words were heard which David spake, they rehearsed them before Saul and sent for him. And David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail, because of him thy servant will go and fight with the Philistine. Can you imagine this scene, just this young ruddy, it says, Shepherd boy coming in and you have, I mean, it says that Saul was a, a shoulders height, head taller than everybody. I'm short. Who's the tallest person in here? Brother Bad? Brother here? Brother Anthony. <laughs> okay, we'll give it to Brad. Imagine Brad if he was like 6'6". Six, six. Okay, 6'6", six, 6'6", six, uh, six, six, Brad. I mean, this young little shepherd boy, Ruddy, says, just like, hey, hey, man, I could take him. I know the God that we serve. What are you doing? Man, what are you shaking in your boots? Like, that's your armor right there. I'm your armor bearer. Do something. Like, I heard the story when you tore the oxen. I, I heard the story when you, when, you, when you got delivered, how you praised God and you jumped and you shouted. Why are you trembling now? What's the difference between 2022 and 2010? Somebody. And Saul said to David, Thou art not able to go to the Philistine to fight with him, for thou art but a youth. I see you face to face. And he a man of war from his youth. And David said to Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear. And took a lamb out of the flock, and I went out after him and smote him and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and smote him and slew him. This is no light thing. I know when you read through these scriptures, you can almost gloss over and just be like, man, that's crazy. That's almost like a movie. But the Spirit of God came upon them, and he grabbed the lion by, by his mane and, like, tore him in half. There are challenges that you have already overcome. What's the difference between this one and this next one that arises? He still leaned on the power of God and the spirit of God in, in a season. Now he's still, he still has that same faith as he's there present before all of Israel. And he went out after him and he's rehearsing these things like, man, I see my, I have overcome something like this. I can do this. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he had defied the the armies of the living God. David said, Moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he would deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. When Saul addresses David and he says, Thou art not be able to go against this Philistine because you're only a youth, and he's been a warrior since his youth, That's almost telling me that he heard and he knew about this champion from even before his ancestors probably passed down these great testimonies, these stories about the children of Gad and um, these giants that roamed in the earth. And it probably struck fear in him in this moment. He's like, he's finally in front of me. I have only heard of a trial like this, and now it's finally present. 
And now he's in front of me boasting 40 days and he's actually trembling. My, my whole family and my friends, everybody, the whole armies, we can't move. Things will always be the same. Things will always be the same. How, how It's a scale. It's, it's a ratio thing that we have here. We have a giant that's taunting the whole army and nobody can. In their minds, they think that it is almost impossible. Not even just for a ruddy boy, but just for any one person. Is there any soldier in this whole army that's even willing to go even try and attempt, even sacrifice their life? Like, okay, well, let me go see if he's weak on this side. Maybe I can attack him from the, from the side. Maybe, he does, he doesn't have, he, maybe he's not left-handed. There was nobody willing to even try. God forbid that there is a youth, there is even a leader in here that's not willing to try. Not willing to step up and say, Lord, I might not know it all, but I read about this thing called grace, and you allow me to operate in a way where I am weak and you are strong. I've seen you move in my life. You've delivered me out of the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear the mouth of the lion and the paw of the bear. You can do the same thing here in this situation. Things can change. Things will not remain the same. I see some of you youth right now. It's bouncing off your mind and it's too hard to digest, but I see some of you ingesting all of this. And I tell you, I want before this end of this service for all of you youth to be able to understand the God that you serve. There are parents in here that understand this. You are the next generation, and you will get this. I hear talks about, man, this generation is going to face some things that we've never seen. You know, back in the day, this was not even spoken about. That was taboo, but now it's just all out in the open, and, like, they're just flaunting it left and right on the streets and everywhere. What are our kids going to do? Should we just move out of state and go to Idaho? Should we just go somewhere in, like, in the caves and just, just be a hermit? We'll just bring our Bibles and we'll have our Bible studies and just, we're not called to be that. We're called to be the salt and the light of the earth. We're not losing our savor to get trampled on. If the Bible says that he is greater, greater is he that, that greater is he that is in me. I'm sorry, my words are getting twisted. And then he that is in this earth, in this world, I can't take a time out and say, Things will just remain all the same. Well, I'm going to sit on the sideline and let Brother Brad do all the work. This is all hands on deck. This is every soldier. I need to grab a sword. I need to grab a sling. Whether I am left-handed and I have this capability or I have this talent or this gifting or I'm right-handed. I don't have the gifting, but I need to get under authority. I need to get under a pastor. I need to get under my youth leader and say, what can I do to help? Where can, I, where can I fit in, uh, Brother Godfrey, Sister Lisa? I know I haven't been vocal, and I've been kind of quiet, and I've been doing my own thing, but I'm tired of struggling with this giant voice in my life today, and I need deliverance. I need victory. Why is only a handful of getting victory? I want that same victory. You can get that victory here. You don't need to wait till Wacon or senior camp or when Victor Jackson comes preaching. It does, you can get it in your home. You see, if the Spirit of God is dwelling in you and you're hungry, the Holy Ghost can give you deliverance. Amen? One ruddy boy that was just tending to the smallest things. When his brothers said, no, I don't want that job, Dad, Jesse, I want to go be a soldier. Let me... Let me, let me tend to the horses or let me help, help, help you out work. The sheep, that's for, get David to do it. Brother Godfrey, I'll do whatever you want. <laughs> what do you need? What do you need? What do you need, Sister Lisa? I'm telling you, some person is getting this right now. I thank you, Lord. Confront your giant. Amen. Don't be intimidated anymore. This is the time and the hour to know and to understand what lieth in you, what the Holy Ghost is trying to accomplish in your life. It's no time to be passive and to be intimidated. Not to rely on our own strengths. The Bible says, Paul writes this to the Corinthians. He says that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. 
They're not natural, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. There's a theme in this whole story. You see, David got it. He doesn't say, man, I'm the one that delivered myself out of the paw of that bear and the mouth of that lion. It's the Spirit of God that delivered me, and I'm going to be delivered from this Philistine. I'm going to go before him, but the Lord is with me. We're going to continue to read. And now where are we? Verse 40. And he took his staff in his hand and chose him five smooth stones out of the brook and then and put them in a shepherd's bag, which he had, even a scrip. And his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. He's willing to confront his giant. Enough is enough. And the Philistine came on and drew near unto David. And the man bare the shield before went before him. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David disdain him, for he was but a youth and ruddy and of a fair countenance. And the Philistine said unto David, Am I a dog? That thou comest to me with staves, and the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, I will give you thy flesh unto the fowls of the air and to the beasts of the field. Okay, you want to step up to the plate? I'll let you do this. Don't back down now. Don't back down then, youth. Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with with sword and a spear and with a shield. You have all of these. You have so much. You have so much weaponry, so much arsenal. You, you have this backing of this, of, of, of maybe Congress or whatever you have. You have the whole earth at your disposal. But I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts and the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. David, the only ruddy boy, the, a ruddy boy on the scene, only but a youth, finally gets in and says, you know what, I'm going to speak today. I'm going to pray out loud today. I'm not just going to let this pass me by. This day is special and it's anointed and I'm going to take full advantage of it. And I'm not going to stand by anymore. My family needs this. My friends need this. My classmates need this. This day will the Lord deliver thee into my hand and I will smite thee and take thine head from thee. And I will give thee the carcass of the host of the Philistines this day with the fowls of the air and to the wild beasts. He's pretty much saying everything that Goliath was taunting him with. You, you said that all these things, are you prophesying? What are you, you saying that it, it, there's no hope for this youth in this generation? No. <laughs> no I, I don't think so. I think I, believe, I know with, with 100% uh, everything that I, of fiber in my body that the Lord ha, is going to keep thee. He will deliver thee out of thy hand with a strong hand. And all this assembly, verse 47, shall I know that the Lord saveth not with, watch this, with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's and will give you into our hands. Somebody got it. Somebody got it on the battlefield. Thank God for, the, for, for one, one ruddy boy getting, uh, having the understanding that it's not by me or by the, set, the, the six other brothers that I have or the lineage that I have or if this is, I'm a second generation apostolic and my dad and my grandma, they have the Holy Ghost. It's because the Lord has been favored in my life. It's the Lord that I serve, whether I came into it right now in first generation or I'm brand new. And this is my first youth service. It does not matter because the Lord, the Lord is the one that has the battle. He's the one that delivers. It's not by our might or by our strength. Goliath, you're going down. Verse 48, and it came to pass when the Philistine arose and came and drew nigh to meet David, that David hasted and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. There's a little bit of separation here. Youth, you got to separate yourself from a little bit of your peers sometimes. They might not worship with you. They might, I don't want to go to, I don't want to go to that youth service, man. I got, I got, man, let's go out here. Let's go to the mall. Let's go watch that movie. There's a little bit of separation here between David and the rest of the armies. Everyone's armed. They have enough fighting experience. As I said, in, when you read, we do the history search between the Benjamites, they were mighty valiant men. At the end of uh, the Judges, the book of Judges, the beginning of it, you see them just like, just trying to get their bearing, establishing their army by the end of it. Man, they're tough. They can gather men, mighty, valiant men of sword, but then the Benjamites, mighty with sling and able to kill within a hair's breadth, 
They got talent. But at the end of the whole Judges, it says that there was no king in Israel, and every man did their own thing. That was the whole demise between that. And they asked for a king, and here they have a final king. King Saul to lead them into battle, but now he's dismayed and he's shaking in his tent. He had the ability. He was left-handed. He could have easily got on there and said, let me grab these stones, David. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Let me lead by example. Let me get dirty. Let me get my feet on the ground. And let me, let me show you. Hold on. Because my family is watching. Jonathan is watching. Um, my brother, my cousin. Let, let me do some things right now. Every man can be used. Therefore, David ran and stood upon the Philistine, took his sword, and drew it out of the sheath. Oh, I'm, I'm jumping way too ahead. David put his hand in his bag and took hence then a stone and slang it and um, smote the Philistine in his forehead and the, that the stone sunk in his, to his forehead and his face fell upon the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with his sling and with the stone and smote the Philistine and slew him, but there was no sword in the hand of David. He came there just with simple, simple things. With the which was sling, it was just very portable. I mean, to me, it's just like something that you can always bring uh, with you out in public, out even in school. It's just your, it's the Holy Ghost. It's just your simple praying underneath your breath. Here, it's not much. It's not flashy. It's not this big thing like, hey, I'm boisterous right now, or it's like defensive. Get away from me. Don't, 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 don't mess with me. I'm armed. But a sling is probably just hidden. It's something here between you and the Lord. And he takes it, so he doesn't have a sword just yet. But he took this uh, Goliath's sword and drew it out of the sheath thereof and slew him and cut off his head therewith. And when the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they fled. They fled. The whole host of the Philistine army. Man, these are some giants. Goliath had brothers. I mean, he had cousins. He, who knows how many giants were present. But I'm telling you, the Bible is true for what it reads. And it says the whole Philistine army ran because finally one ruddy boy stood up and said, enough is enough. And came with a simple idea that, God, it's with it, 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 it's, it's You've given the anointing. I'm going to take my shot and I'm just going to throw it. I'm going to show up here in this youth service. I'm going to give it all I got. I'm going to worship. I'm going to sing. I'm going to pray. Lord, I don't know what, what the next hour looks like or what next week looks like, but I'm just going to get on my knees and I'm going to pray. And I'm going to pray the prayer of faith because today, this, this morning in prayer, we woke up and we gathered our men for prayer at our church. And I knew the direction of the story didn't write anything down, but I was the Lord was just rehearsing things in my head. It's almost like I could see David just running with this thing and just had so much incredible faith as he threw this through this rock, this little smooth stone, and it sunk, and it wasn't even a big shock. Like, oh man, I made contact. What? Did you see that, Eliab? I told you, you gave me such a hard time for being here, but I did it. He wasn't even worried about anybody else. He just threw that thing because this is in the name of the Lord. I'm just going to pray by effectual, fervent praying. I'm just going to take my shot. And it, the Lord just showed me these simple things. The rocks were his faith. This is a measure of faith. And I'm going to throw it. It's probably, yeah, I know it says the Benjamites had so much skill and talent to be able to throw it. But when it's in the right hands, when weapons and, and, and tools are in the right person, it's cause for affection. You can, put, you can lay your hands on even your people, young people, on, on your friends and pray, and they will be healed. You can pray a prayer of faith. There's something like that's when an innocent child of God that just with so much love of God, and they just lay their hands just genuinely, on, even on the elderly in here, and they pray with just this urgency, Lord, heal my dad, heal my mom. But they just take the shot in faith. God rewards it and sees it. Now a giant. It doesn't matter whether it's cancer or whether it's whatever doubt or depression. It can go. It will sink into the earth. It says that it sunk into its head. I love how the writer is describing this great scene. It doesn't just doesn't bounce off and uh, deflects and he just gets nicked and he's like dazed. It says it sinks into the deeper part of his forehead and his face hits the earth. It hits the earth. It tells me that there's something obvious when you pray, young person. It's not just something like, oh, what a lucky shot. 
No, it was so obvious that the enemy had to come crashing down. But I tell you, in prayer this morning, it wasn't just enough just to have faith. It wasn't just enough to have the stones and just say, okay, this one's smooth. Lord, you've delivered my family. I know you've given me authority and anointing. It says that Samuel anointed with oil. And, okay, I have a calling on my life. Let me just take this shot of faith. And I threw the sling, and it's not enough to slay the giant. What is the weapon that slays the giant? It's Goliath's sword. And as I was going, meditating on this in prayer this morning, I could just see the word of God taking shape as a sword as David would slay the giant and cut his head off. I know it says that it's, it's, it's Goliath's sword. It's the sword of Goliath, but it's heavy. This is a young ruddy boy who's able to pick up this heavy sword and also use it against his own person, his, his own enemy. But the moment that he was down, he relinquishes all his rights for that weapon. It's now yours. And it's now your authority, young person, to be able to grab that sword. And I tell you, when I was looking and searching in in my meditation this morning with the word of God, the Lord was just saying, this is is the youth's sword. This is their power. If they can just get this word inside their spirit, they can approach a situation also with faith. But when the word of God is mixed with faith, then that's when the effectual fervent prayer of the righteous man availeth much. It accomplishes so much. The Bible, James is writing about even a, a natural scenario between how a person can pray. A man, when you read further in James chapter 5, it talks about Elias. Elijah, and how he prayed that it wouldn't rain on the earth for three, over the space of uh, seven years or three and a half years. It didn't rain, and in three and a half years, it did rain. But it says that he was subject to like passions, just as you and I. He was a man just like you, Brother Brad. Woke up in the morning, probably, you know, grumpy before his coffee. Probably wakes up in the middle of the night to use the restroom, gets sick, gets a cold. Like my, my, my son over there gets RSV and coughs and has boogers down his nose. I have this little burp rag up here because I forgot my handkerchief. He's a man just like passions, just like you and I, youth. But yet he prayed. It says that he prayed so, he, his faith mixed with the word of God was so strong. The effectual fervent prayer of his was so powerful that it didn't rain on the earth. Not just, it says, in the earth. Not just in the, in, in, in the Middle East region. Just, not just in Israel or Canaan. But it just, in the whole entire earth. The earth is big. The earth is vastly big. It is so big. And the the Bible does say that it did not rain in the entire earth. That's the type of prayer that you can pray. If you can mix this word with your faith, amen, there is no generation like yours. You're precious. You're called out. There is the hour is late, so you are the hour. There are people, and it's beautiful to see your youth leaders and your pastors come here on a Saturday and, and men of this church and women of this church to pour into you and to pray over you and to believe in you, youth. Don't discount the shepherding. Don't discount those little jobs. I tell you, I want to share this really quick. I didn't grow up in this. I was probably 30 years old when I came to the church. That was, oh, I'm 40, 10 years ago. Got the Holy Ghost baptized. Ooh, I love, thank you, Lord, for this wonderful, wonderful life. But I struggle just like anybody else. We're just like, we're just like each other. But there was a short season, very short, one summer when I was about 12 years old. My mother sent me t- across the, to m- this little town in Missouri, Washington, uh, Missouri said Washington. Little city called Neosho, Missouri. My uncle was the first person to leave. Everybody from my islands is predominantly Catholic. Almost everybody. Now they're mixed. But my uncle was shunned, almost cut off from all my family in the islands, even here in Washington. No phone calls, nothing, except for my mother. 
I knew the Lord. And now that I look back on it, I know it's the Lord's hands at work. But she said, you know what? I don't care about all that. I'm going to send you over there for this entire summer. Okay. I know he has two. I have two other cousins over there. I'll go play. As a young 12-year-old boy, I didn't know anything. But he joined an apostolic church, little humble church. And the youth leader took me under his wing there. And I didn't understand everything. I mean, coming from my background, I was like, what is this? I would rather be playing basketball. I'm looking at some. <laughs> I'd rather be doing something with my friends, some gaming or I don't know, riding my bike back then or playing outside. But I thank God that somebody in my family made a choice to seek after God, know that there's more and God impressing him and being obedient to him. Like, okay, let me find a church here. There, there's, there's, more to, uh, there's more to you, Lord, than just what I've seen in the islands and in, in my life. And he brings me along to the church. The whole summer, I'm spending time in little youth services, little Bible studies. I didn't understand the whole thing. At 12 years old, I'm just like, man, okay. But I felt something. Whew. I'm telling you, I, it marked me for the rest of my life. I'm still marked today. And I knew whatever God deposited in those little moments and those little seasons of shepherding sheep, just those little moments. You see, I'm not saying like I'm going to go actually feed sheep and save them from a bear or a lion, but these little moments where God takes you and it's just you, you don't even understand the whole picture. But it's okay if you don't understand. Because when I was 30 years old, it all came back to full circle. Amen? God probably won't, the Lord, if the Lord tarries, I don't know how long, but nobody knows, right? But take advantage of the time that you have right now. You don't have to go out into the world and experience these things and say, well, I salute, a, I, fought, I came back to church, God, and I slayed the giant. But take advantage of what you have now. Your Bible studies, <laughs> the worship team, wherever God will lead you, wherever your youth leaders, when they're praying after the Holy Ghost and they're asking God, where do you want this youth to go? What is the word that you have for them today? Get underneath them because I'm telling you, you can take down these giants that are in the earth. There are there is revival coming. I know you've probably been hearing that, but I'm telling you, if we're on the cusp, we're not even on the cusp. We are there. We are there. The harvest is so ripe. There's so many opportunities for Bible studies. All you have to do is just open your mouth. You see, David was the only ready boy that said, wait a minute. No. Right now. 40 days, the giant boasted. Only one ruddy boy said, wait a minute. No, enough is enough. I'm going to put my foot down right now. All in a moment, wait a minute, do you need a Bible study? There are souls that are waiting. Your P7 clubs are waiting right around the corner. I tell you, the joy of the Lord is your strength. I can't, I can't explain how it gives you so much strength, but when you see your friends coming to God and coming to your youth group and saying, I don't know what it is about that group, but I love it. Thank you for inviting me. There's going to be a joy that comes over. You're going to be like, man, this is, this is it. This is my calling. This is what everybody, all hands on deck. Amen. I'm coming down to a close. I'm going to read in verse 55. And when Saul saw David go forth against the Philistine, he said unto Abner, the captain of the host, Abner, whose son is this youth? I thought the chapter before said that he was his uh, armor bearer. It's okay to get overlooked. And Abner said, As thy soul liveth, O king, I cannot tell. And the king said, Inquire thou whose son the stripling is. You know, stripling, when you look up the, uh, the Greek, it means like someone that's just overlooked, out of sight, not even like known. But it's okay because it was God's chosen. You are God's chosen. Verse 57, and as David returned from the slaughter of the Philistine, Abner took him and brought him before Saul with the head of the Philistine in his hand. That's a, I have the giant that was boasting, but he's no longer speaking. He's no longer a voice in my family. He's no longer boasting anymore 40 days. He's come to a close. The depression, the anxiety, everything has shut its mouth. 
Verse 58, this is my last verse. And Saul said to him, whose son art thou, thou young man? And David answered, I am the son of thy servant, Jesse the Bethlehemite. I love it because he even honors his dad. Even though his dad overlooked him, his brothers overlooked him. Even the prophet Samuel said, no, your, old, your three older brothers are the ones. He was overlooked all his, of his life. And even being an armor bearer to the king, he was overlooked. It says, Who's, it says three times in these four verses, whose son is this? Whose son art thou? Who are you? Where did you come from? It's okay to be a nobody from nowhere. Faith mixed with the word is powerful. The effectual fervent prayer of the righteous man availeth much. But I want to share, I hope you can deposit this into your spirit right now. Youth, young person, if we can stand to our feet. You might not think so highly of yourself today in this place. There's many other youth that are even right here next to me on this pew. There's many youth when I gather into a sectional meeting and into, into, the, into a camp meeting. There's adults that can even take this mantle. They can handle this. They're more equipped than I. Who am I but just a ready youth? But I tell you the words of the Lord today. As he led me through prayer, he said, make sure every youth that shows up today understands that even if you are overlooked for a moment in all of your life, you are somebody special before the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He has known you. If the Bible says that he knew you before, he formed you in the womb. That is every single soul that is created by the hands of God. It says that you were fearfully and wonderfully made. He knows the very count of hair on your head. I tell you, he knows you intimately. And if you would just open your heart today and understand that the tools that are before you, God would use you. He would anoint that blessing. He would anoint your gifting. Because without the anointing of God, you will be weaponless on the battlefield. But he wants to plea and open your heart today. He wants to be your God and to show the giant, to show your school, to show the earth that you are his son. You are his daughter. You are a peculiar person right now in this hour. Hallelujah. Would you lift up your voice with me today, Jesus? Thou hast already moved from the beginning of this service. You knew every day that is present in this house. Your anointing is set before us, Father. The words that were spoken today, Father, I hide them on my heart, on the tables, on the tablets of my heart, Jesus. Write your law upon them. It is my joy and my strength. We love you, Jesus. Let your word be a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path, Father. Let those that are around me see the light. Let them find you in this dark hour. And the darker it gets, the more that your light will shine you. Hallelujah, hallelujah. These altars are open right now. I pray, even if you're young or old, that you would come and respond unto God. Let him do a work in you right now. It's a supernatural work. You can't fight earthly things. You can't fight that giant with earthly weapons. You can only do it in the Holy Ghost with his strength. Hallelujah.